early on Sunday morning. As a new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Then sings my soul. For an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, rolled away the stone. Don't be afraid, he said. I know you're looking for Jesus, who is crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said would happen. Then sings my soul. For God has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins, all praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by His great mercy that we've been born again. Because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead, now we live with great expectation.
2,000 years ago. The tomb was empty on Easter Sunday because death could not hold down Jesus, our Savior. He rose from the dead, and now we have hope. Sweet bright crimson robes draped over the ashes. A wide open tomb where they should be cast. The children are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Roses in bloom, pushed up from the embers. The rivers of tears flow from good times to mend. The families are singing and dancing and laughing. The Father is welcoming. This is our homecoming. Heaven joins in with the glory and sound. In the great cloud of Cause the ones that were lost are finally 
of Jesus, you are worthy today. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb.
powerful truth this Easter morning. We're so glad that you're here to worship together and to remember and be reminded of that truth of who Jesus is. And uh, for right now, why don't you turn to a few people around you, shake some hands, you can say Happy Easter. He is risen and grab a seat. Church, happy Easter. We're so glad you're here. Can we just give the band another round of applause? This is so exciting. They have put a lot of time and effort into this. They're all, they have one more to go. They're the six of seven, and they've, we're just so grateful for them. If you are new, we're so glad you're here. Please text new to the number on the screen. We would love to connect with you, get to know you. We would love for this to be home for you, um, for you to be a part of the family. So make sure you text new to that number. And if you've been kicking the tires for the last couple of weeks and your family is new to Foundations, please stop at our Next Steps area. We have a gift for you. We'd love to meet with you and get you connected. We are on week one of our um, series, Love Is. And so make sure that you stop by um, the next couple of weeks. We really are excited about this series. We have several opportunities for you um, to take pictures, um, photo booths, and all the things in the lobby. So make sure that you grab a family picture before you leave. We're so glad you're here. Happy Easter. All right, well, happy Easter. I want to welcome everybody here, everybody at Windsor. I, I know today we're celebrating the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, but we're also starting a series called What Is, or we're talking about love, and we're asking the question, what is love? Now, I know that when that bumper was played and that video was played, everybody in here, just you just wanted to, you just, so I'm going to give you that opportunity, all right? Let's do it. Here we go. Anyway, for, for anybody out there that doesn't know what that is, that's a, that's a movie that old people think is funny. So that's what that is. Anyway, we are, uh, we are asking the question, what is love? Because I believe one of the most important things about you is not just who you love, but it's, it's what you even mean by love. When you say that you love your kids, when you say you love your spouse, when you say you love your family, your friends, when you say you love, or even as followers of Christ, as we're commanded to love all people, what does that, what does that really mean? Several years ago, I read uh, 1 John 3.16. There's just this one line, this one line stood off the page to me, and I had to just, I just had to stop, close my Bible, and think about this for a second. In 1 John 3.16, it says, this is how we know what love is. This really stuck out to me because I just for the first time, I thought, wait, do I not know what love is? What, how do I define love? Where did I come up with my definition? I would challenge you to think about that. Where did you derive your understanding of what love is? And the point I want to make for this series, but I, I think is a point that I would just leave you with today, this is probably one of the highest things I want to give you, is just this idea that, that most of our definitions for love are kind of weak. And especially just if you're just talking culturally, the way you were raised, what you hear, what you see on the media, the way people talk about love, it's actually like a really bad definition because it's all rooted in love being this emotion, this, this feeling that we have towards people or other people have towards us. And that probably makes sense because when you heard love, when you were growing up and you were defining and you were learning it in context, just like you do everything else, you probably heard it in a really emotional situation. Like maybe you were a, a teenage daughter and you were, uh, you were fighting with your mom because that's what moms and teenage daughters do. And uh, you were fighting with your mom, you had an argument, and then the next day before you went to school, your mom grabbed you and she was like, hey, and, and, and with tears in her eyes, she said, I just want you to know I love you. 
And so because you've heard love in context like that, you start to think, oh, that's what love is. It's this, this thing that someone feels for me or it's a thing that I feel for other people. And especially when it comes to romantic love. When it comes to the romantic love, it's all in the feels. Like, that's the whole thing. I, I, I spent, uh, you know, I've got two boys and two girls. With my two girls, I watched a lot of, like, teen dramas, you know. Everything from there's this one, like, uh, Australian show about mermaids. I don't know if anybody knows what I'm talking about. And, uh, and then there's, this, like, there's, like, Twilight. Like, and so I've watched that actually several times with my girls. So just the, the back and forth. Team Jacob. By the way, I don't know if there's any, any other two. Yeah, there's one super. That's an old movie too. Um, and, and then I just watch these things, and the and the the rom coms or whatever it is, it always has the kind of the same thing. It's just it's usually a girl, but sometimes it's a guy. Somebody trying to figure out. Well, I like them, but do I? Do I love them? And there's this internal guide that we're trying to figure out is whether or not there's love involved. And I'm just like, just gag me. Like what? It is this very highly emotionally driven thing, and we think of love as this emotion. And on a very serious note, we, we, we begin to chase that emotion, and that's what love is to us. It's we want to experience that emotion. We want other people to experience it, and that's what becomes the definition of love. I talked with a guy one time who had left his wife and children, and they'd been married for about 12 years, and he, mar- or he, he, he was uh, with a woman who he had committed adultery with. Essentially, it was an old high school friend that he met at a bar, rekindled the flame. And so now he's leaving his wife and kids, and he's going to, to live with her and be with her. So I sat down with him. He'd been going to the church for quite a while, and I turned to him, and I said, Hey, man, I, why? Why are you doing this? And he says, Because, talking about the other woman, he says, Because I love her. And without even thinking about it, I responded back, man, I don't think you know what love is because you're doing the exact opposite of love right now. I think we define so much and so intensely love around the idea of what we're feeling, what we're experiencing, and the emotion of it all that we come up with, with a description of love, but it is a weak sauce description and definition of love. And I would make the argument that love is so much more. I would make the argument in most cases that love is something completely opposite than what we've learned our whole life. Even in Webster's Dictionary, this isn't just me, Webster's Dictionary says that love, this is the definition of love in our world, a strong affection, feeling, emotion for another uh, arising out of kinship or personal ties. We are driven by this affection, and so we start to chase that emotion. And then when we don't receive the kind of emotion, when we aren't having that experience or that emotion that we want or other people aren't, and then we go, well, I must not love them or they must not love me, and and we get it all mixed up. And we're following our heart. And I just want to remind you what Scripture teaches us. This is one of the foundational things of Scripture. It teaches us about our heart, which is the seat of emotions, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. And beyond cure, who can understand it? And we're using it as a guide. And I want to make the point that love is actually opposite. And so I want to give us a definition today that I I want to talk about during this series. But love, the, the, the way we see it, is so different than the world. I would say it's this. Love is a decision we make in spite of, often, not always, but often, in spite of how we feel. My, uh, my wife and I have been married for 27 years. My wife, yeah, well, thank you. It's been 20 of the greatest years of our life. So, um, <laughs> no, no, 27 years, and she, uh, she wakes up to this every morning. <laughs> and she makes a decision. To love me. She doesn't look at me every day and go, ooh, look at you, you pot-bellied stallion. You know, she doesn't. <laughs> My new car smell wore off about five years into marriage, okay? <laughs> love is, is a decision. When it comes down to it, it's not about how you feel. Yes, it's great when, when the feelings are there and everything, and you, there are moments like that for sure. But, but really what we're doing is we're, we're choosing. Love is just what you choose. It is your actions. It is your behavior. What are you going to choose to do for somebody else? And whatever you choose to do is either love or it is not love. 
If you were going to throw away your whole understanding of love, if you were to be like, okay, my whole definition of love is messed up. I've gotten it from the world, the culture around me. Where should we start? I would start, and and we're going to do this over the, the course of the week, but I would just start with this. Love is a person. Love is a person. Throw away everything you understand about love and understand that love is a person. In 1 John chapter 4, verse 8, it tells us who that person is. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. He doesn't just teach us about love. He doesn't just have attributes of love. He himself is love. That means that everything that God has ever done is love and motivated by love. But I want you to think about what that means because there's there's a lot that we experience in this world that God has to have a hand in and we act very dis. uh, confused and disappointed a lot of times because we're like, well, God should have done this if he's love, or we see him in scripture and we go, man, the the things I see in scripture, that doesn't feel like like love. Give you, for instance, um, some people talk about the Bible as a love story, you know, and I'm like, yeah, it's, no, I mean, it's a love story. I mean, it's a love story where this guy named David kills 400 uh, or kills 200 Philistines and cuts off their foreskins and puts them in a sack. I mean, it's, it's that kind of love story, you know, but, but yeah, so it's, it's a love story, but, um, but it's, it's God. And there's a lot of times where we see God doing some things where we're just kind of like, mm, I don't feel like that's love. For instance, uh, there was a time where God led him out of Egypt, led him through the Red Sea, took him out to the mountain. Moses went up on the mountain. He left the Israelites for just a few days. The Israelites immediately forgot everything that God had done. And they began to build a golden calf, and they began to worship the golden calf, and they had abandoned God as their God really, really quickly after all he'd done. And so God was angry. God has emotions too. God was angry, and, he, and it says that God is a jealous God. And so he came up with a plan. He says, I'm going to go destroy them. And Moses was like, well, no, 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 don't, don't, don't destroy them. Like, we just, we're just getting started here. And so he's like, okay, I won't destroy him. So Moses goes down. We, this is the part we tell our kids in the children's classes. And then Moses comes down and he breaks the Ten Commandments and he, he rebukes them. We don't tell the next part in our children's classes. For the life of me, I can't figure out why people decided somewhere along the way that the Bible is a story for children, okay? But here's what happens next. God tells Moses, he wants you to strap on a sword and I want you to go kill everybody responsible. So he goes and kills everybody responsible for making the idol. And then he grinds down the idol, the gold of the idol into dust, puts it in water and makes them all drink it. Because God is love. (laughs) And when we see those things, we think to ourselves, well, that doesn't seem very loving. And I guess what I would argue is, if you just give God the benefit of the doubt, that, that maybe... Maybe it's our definition of love and our understanding of life and understanding of what love is that's, that's broken. God is love. Colossians chapter 2 says that for in Christ, in Jesus, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. So Jesus is God with skin on. Or maybe for our point today, Jesus is love with skin on. The closest you'll be able to understand love is if you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and if you listen to the things that Jesus actually said, and if you, sh- and you see the things that he actually did. But don't do this. Don't come up with your own idea of what love is and then project that on Jesus and go, yeah, yeah, I guess I need to be more like Jesus. Jesus was soft, and Jesus was weak, and Jesus... Like, didn't, didn't actually have any conviction about anything. That's what we have a tendency to do. No, actually go and read through the Gospels, and you'll realize that maybe, just maybe, the Jesus that you have conjured in your mind isn't the Jesus that actually exists. And everything that Jesus did is a representation of actual love that shakes our understanding. Love is Jesus. He isn't capable of it. It isn't an attribute of his. Jesus is love. Now, let's start with the most basic thing that Jesus did for us. Let's start with the most basic act, the most important thing, the thing that we're here to celebrate, back to our passage in 1 John 3.16. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. This is the definition of love. And you might be like, yeah, yeah, no, that's good, yeah. Sacrificial love, that's really important, that's good. I'm glad that Jesus 
Glad that Jesus showed us an example of sacrificial love. And I want to say, mm, I don't think that's the point. Sacrificial love has been around for a long time. That's been around since the beginning of time. There are women that have sacrificed their lives for their child running through a burning building, literally tortured and died in order to save their child. There's, there's soldiers in every nation and every continent between, uh, and country but since the beginning of time who have sacrificially, voluntarily laid down their life for their country and their families. Sacrificial love is not new, and it's not particularly unhuman or in, uh, not of this world. Jesus came and he laid down his life. I think the emphasis is for us. He, unlike us, he, he knows us. He knows you better than you know you. He, he knows you. He's been there your whole life. I think sometimes we all play this game where we do have guilt. We have guilt. We have shame. All of us carry that around. Many of us deal with it in, in all kinds of different ways. Some of us just lean into it, and we just pursue it, and we're like, yeah, that's just my identity. Some of us, like, wrestle with it internally and never tell another soul, and we die sort of slightly. Some of us try to convince ourselves that we're not this way, and so we kind of point out the flaws of other people, but we all wrestle with this heavy burden of guilt and shame because we know we're not who we're supposed to be. And sometimes we convince people that, that we're not that. But it's almost like we forget. God's seen everything. There was a time in my life where I rejected God wholesale without even looking into or, or asking who he was. I rejected God without even investigating to see if the claims of Jesus were true. I just rejected him because I didn't want God and I didn't want him in my life. I rebelled against him. I sinned against him. And I essentially just gave my middle finger to heaven. And God, he just watched. And what did he do in response? Well, he did something that the world would never do. Not one person in this world would ever do this for somebody. He looked at my ungodliness, my sin, my rebellion against him, the, the corruption of who I was, and he died for me. That's something different than the world has ever seen. And that's the message of Christianity. There's kind of this new version of Christianity that's kind of rising up. I hear it every once in a while, and, and the message basically goes like this. Well, Jesus loves you because he sees the good in you. Like, he, he, he sees the good in you, and yeah, you do, you, maybe not perfect, but he sees the good in you, and he died for you so that you could, you could bring those good parts out. And I want to tell you, that's not Christianity. That's Star Wars. <laughs> like, that's the theme of Star Wars. Like, Anakin turns to the dark side, becomes bad, but everybody's hopeful because they see the good in him, right? And so Padme's, one of her last words is, there's still good in him. And, and Luke Skywalker, when he sees his dad, he's like, I, I see that I sense the good in you. And so we hold out hope because there's good in him. I just want you to know that's not, that's not what Christianity is. That's not why Jesus died for you. It's, it's because he knew the goodness that was not inside of you. And yet he chose not just to forgive you, but to die for you. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 says, You see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Before I had even looked in to ask the question, Is God real? Is Jesus really his son? Before any of that even happened in my life, he died for me in the middle of my sin. And then Paul makes, a, I think, sometimes a, a, a misunderstood or overlooked illustration. He says this, very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. I just want you to think of the people in your life you would die for, and immediately probably what pops into your kids is in your head is your kids, right? If you've got kids. I've got four kids, and I would die for three of them without even thinking of them. <laughs> um, I'm just kidding. I'd die for all my children. Um, die for my spouse. I'd die for lots of people around. You know, there's like these people that immediately come to my head I would die for. Absolutely. Now I want you to think about the person in your life that has wronged you the most. Taken from you. Maybe it was an abusive parent or a narcissistic friend or an alcoholic of, uh, sibling. It was somebody in your life that 
that took the most from you. They hurt you, they betrayed you, they lied to you, they left you, they left you feeling a, a lack of worth because they were just that selfish. Would you even give them a plate of cookies? And you probably wouldn't die for them. You probably wouldn't pay a t parking ticket for them. And Jesus, knowing us, he, he died for us. That's a love the world has never seen before. In our world, you do good to me and I'll do good to you. You love me, I'll love you. You take care of me, I'll take care of you. You treat with me with respect and I'll do it. It's a do for me and I'll do for you uh, type of world. That's the world we live in. And most of us in here are going, yeah, and that's the way it should be. And Jesus comes in and breaks all of those rules and loves people who are undeserving of it by giving up his life. A few years ago, uh, probably I think one of the most hated people in the world was Derek Chauvin. When I put this up here, I realize it creates emotions, and it creates emotions for a lot of people. If you're a person of color, it creates emotions for one reason. If you're in law enforcement, it creates emotions for other people. If you, if you just see it from a political perspective, it might create emotions. But here's the thing. A couple of years ago, people hated him. Everybody hated him. I had law enforcement friends who were like, man, I can't stand him because he makes law enforcement look bad. And then I had other friends that were just like, yeah, I can't stand him because he represents everything that's wrong with law enforcement. And in this whole process, I heard people from, from very liberal and very conservative side, and we had all decided that, yeah, but he was, he was an idiot and we all hated him. We'll let his head roll. And I just wonder how many people in those moments thought, does he know he's loved? Does he know that even though what he did, like he, he killed George Floyd, do we, do, does he know that there is forgiveness in Jesus? And I can tell you, even this weekend, as I've used this illustration, it's already proven to be offensive to people because our minds can't go there. We can't go to a place where we are forgiving some people. And maybe it's not Derek Chauvin for you. Maybe it's somebody else. But I just want you to know, me and him are the same. We are the same. We are in a place and a need, and we might have ended up in different situations in life, but I, I, when I say I need a Savior, I mean I need a Savior. And Jesus died for him, and he died for me. But God, the next verse, it says, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were in the middle of our sin, we're far away, he died for us. That is a love that the world has just never seen. And I've got to be honest, even the best people in here, even the best people in here don't demonstrate that kind of love to die for, to sacrifice your life for the ungodly. But that's not where it stops. He didn't just forgive. He didn't just die. He didn't say, okay, I'll, I'll let you in. It actually tells us that before we believed in Christ, this is true of me and everybody in here, before you put your faith in Christ, you are, a, you are an enemy of God. But after you put your faith in Christ, because of what Jesus did for you, he goes over the top and you go immediately from being an enemy of the one true living God to a child of God. He doesn't just give you the opportunity to be forgiven and write your sins off, but he says, no, and you're going to be my child. 1 John 3, 1 describes to us the love that we should know as followers. He says, see, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God. Um, the story of the prodigal son is probably one that you're familiar with or it heard at some level. It's a simple story where, where a, a, a young man comes to his father and demands his inheritance he says, I want it. I want it right now. I'm going to leave and I'm done with you. Now, if my kids came to me and did that, if one of my four kids, one of my sons came to me and said, hey, I demand my inheritance, I'd be like, all right, well, two things. One, it's a 2013 Ford Focus, so I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how far you're going to get on that. And two, no, I'm not going to give you in your hair. You didn't work for it. You didn't deserve it. You didn't earn it. Like, I'm not going to give it to you just because you want it. Like, that's... That's not what's going to happen. But the father in the story that Jesus tells in Luke 15, he, he gives it to him. 
It's his grace. He says, okay, go ahead, do what you wish. And so he goes, and it tells us that the prodigal son squandered it on wild living. He squandered his money, made bad financial decisions. He made immoral decisions. It says specifically that he squandered it on prostitutes. So he's out there just living for himself. Well, a famine comes on the land. He's, all of his money's gone. He has to work for a hog farmer, a hog farmer that apparently kept a pretty close eye on him because it says he was feeding the hogs the feed, and he wanted to eat the food, but he couldn't eat the food that the hogs were eating. And so he was at his rock bottom, and so he, he came up with an idea. He said, well, why? maybe if I just go back, I can be a servant I don't have to live in the house. He doesn't have to treat me like his son, but maybe he'll give me a job just because I'm, I'm blood. So he goes back just wanting to ask to be a servant. And so he goes back with this, read this in Luke 15. He goes back with this rehearsed speech. He's like, I've sinned against you and I've sinned against heaven. And he just has this apology, this long speech that he like memorizes. And he's saying it over and over on his way back home. And you can see when he gets back home, the father sees him from a long ways off. And he runs out to gra grab him, to meet him. And he starts his speech. And he says, Dad, I've, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. And the dad, the father, cuts him off before he can even finish his rehearsed speech. And he throws his arms around him. And he puts a robe on his shoulders. And he puts a ring on his finger. And he says, tonight we're going to celebrate. We're going to kill the fattened calf because the son of mine was lost. But now he is found. I think many of us have that perception of God that, well, maybe he'll let me in as a servant. Maybe, maybe he'll allow me to, to be a part of his kingdom, but I'm not really a child of God. And if I am a child of God, I'm the black sheep of the family. Do you know what prodigal means? When we think of prodigal, we always think of it as like the bad one. You know, it's a prodigal, yeah, the ones that it goes out there and makes bad mistakes. The word prodigal actually means the lavished one. The whole reason it's called the prodigal story isn't because of his mistake. That's not his identity. His identity is found in what is lavished on him by the father and how he went way over the top and not only gave him everything in response, but he established him as his child. And that's something he offers to anybody who places their faith in him. And as he's telling this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, it's almost like he feels the frustration that we, I sense a lot of times where people don't really believe that. So he says this line. He says, and that is what we are. He's like, do you get it? We're actually the children of God because of what Jesus has done. We're actually his children. And I think if you've put your faith in Christ, sometimes you need to be reminded. You don't have to earn it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to... You don't have to get to a place where you deserve it. You are, in fact, because of what Jesus has accomplished, you are a child of the living God, and you need convinced of that. Uh, we, we got four kids, and we adopted uh, our younger two kids. My 18-year-old we adopted from Guatemala. And uh, one day when he was, <clears throat> when he was nine, uh, we found him kind of crying in his room, and we walked in, and we are like, hey, wh what's the matter, buddy? What's going on? And he, I didn't put this in his head, okay? I don't know where he got this, but I, he said, well, I'm just, I'm afraid if Trump gets elected, they're gonna send me back to Guatemala. And I was like, "Oh, buddy. I'm like, that's not, no, that's not how things work. Like, you're, you're here legally, we adopted you, like, you're officially, you're, you're, there's no way they can take you back, but he wasn't convinced, so mom got out, like, the paperwork, and she, like, showed him the documentation. They're like, hey, look, here's all the paperwork, you know, here's where here's where we, are, we are at in the Guatemalan embassy, and we signed the papers, it's signed by me, it's signed by me, it's signed by George W. Bush, like, it's, like, official, like, this is a real document, and he was unconvinced, and so I changed tactics, and listen, don't, don't judge me, don't send me an email, okay, this is just what I said, <laughs> I don't even know if I'm proud of this, it's just, I needed to convince my son that he was actually my son. So I turned to him and I said, son, do you know what I would do if they ever tried to come and take you? He's like, what? I was like, I'd get out the four guns we have. <laughs> I'd give one to your brother and one to your mother. I'd give the deer rifle to your mother and I'd have a, one of the shotguns. And, and when people came up the, the driveway to come and get you, I'd shoot them. 
and a big smile broke out over his face. And then he went and played video games. Like, he was good. He, he just needed to be convinced. Like, boy, you are my son. There is no difference between anybody else and you in this household. And some of you need to be convinced of that today. If you've put your faith in Christ, if you're following him, you are a child of God. And yeah, we, we want to continue to throw off the sin and the shame. We want to we look towards the things that God is calling us to and not get stuck in the things that are dragging us down and pulling us away from him. But we should do that in the grace of understanding that we are already his children. When I was eight years old, I, uh, I made a decision to get baptized. I, I think I've said this before, but just to reiterate, I, it was not legit, okay? It was a fraud of a baptism because... Because I, here's the deal. I saw my brother get baptized, and after we, he got baptized, we went to Dairy Queen. <laughs> and I was thinking, maybe if I get baptized, we'll go to Dairy Queen, you know. And that was the main motivation was a peanut butter, peanut buster parfait. So, so anyway, I, but I just got baptized to get baptized. But my dad sat down with me when I was getting ready to do it, and he told me this illustration that kind of stuck with me. He said, our life is like a slate, and when we sin, and he listed all the things, when you cuss and you're d disobedient and you make all kinds of bad decisions, when you, when you sin, it makes all these marks all over the slate. But here's the beautiful thing. When you make a decision to follow Christ, you're baptized, it's, it, it's like the slate, slate has wiped clean. And I was like, oh, that's good. And then he said, but you're still going to make mistakes. You're still going to sin. You're not going to be perfect. And so, so when you do sin, you need to... You need to know that that goes back up here, but then all you have to do is pray and repent and ask for forgiveness, and God comes and he erases it. I thought, oh, that, that makes sense as an eight-year-old. Well, I got baptized, we went to Dairy Queen, and then I led a life of rebellion for many, many years. And, uh, and then I came back to Christ. And that's when I actually made a decision to follow Christ. So I was baptized then, and it was legit. It was real. That was the time in my life I was actually giving my life to Christ. But I was still operating with what my dad told me. So I'm still operating in that world, and I'm, I'm trying to live this out. And I'm like, okay, he's wiped the slate clean, and then I would sin. And it was a daily thing. You know, I dropped the F-bomb, and I told an inappropriate joke, and I lied, and I had lustful thoughts. And, and I'd be like, God, would you please forgive me for that? And it was like a daily deal. And it, 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 it wasn't a bad process, but, but then it just... Weeks went by, and I got really busy, and I was in college, and there was times where I'm like, oh, my goodness, it's, it's been a few days, and I haven't, I haven't even repented of my sins, and I realized there was a bunch of stuff in here. So I developed a, a batching system where I'd be like, God, you know the things, right? It's lust, it's lying, it's the F word. Like, it's just like regular stuff. And I would take this before God, and I would... But what this created in me is it created this burden of me just kind of carrying this weight with me all the time. It was like I was dragging away or dragging around this sinful nature. And I had this new accounting system, and it was a better accounting system, but, but it still felt like this weight. And I felt like sometimes I, I, was, I was in the kingdom of heaven, and sometimes I wasn't. Sometimes God was pleased with me, and sometimes God wasn't pleased with me. Sometimes I was going to heaven, and sometimes I thought I might have been going to hell and I was carrying this burden. And some of you carry that same kind of burden with you all the time. Like you're, you're honestly, your approach is, man, I, I love God and I hope, I hope when I stand before God, everything is okay. I hope I've tried to keep this thing as clean as I can. And I want you to know that I learned later in life, I was reading the Bible for myself, which you should totally do. You shouldn't go off of what your parents have told you. In fact, some of the theology that you were taught when you were a kid probably needs to be reviewed as an adult because either one, your parents didn't know what they were talking about, or two, you were eight. And maybe you didn't understand things at the same level. But anyway, I was reading the scripture for myself, and I'd been reading through the book of Romans. I came to Romans chapter 8 that says, so there, now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. No condemnation. And that, not just that verse, but all of Romans, as I began to read it, I've been like, man, it sure seems like God's forgiven me for my, my past, my present, and my future sins. It doesn't seem like it's a slate that I have to keep this new accounting with. It, it seems like he's done something way bigger than just give me a fresh start. The next verse, it says, and because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads 
to death. Not only did he free me from the guilt or my past or, or, or my slate, but he, he freed me from the power that leads to death. And I realized in that moment, when Jesus Christ died for me and I gave my life to him, he didn't give me a do-over. He didn't give me a fresh start. He didn't give me a magic eraser. He, he put to death that inside of me that stood opposed to him and he removed the guilt and the shame and he made me something completely new in Christ. And if you've given your life to him, I want you to know he has freed you. Celebrate that, go ahead, celebrate that. So today, if if you're here and you're a follower of Christ, what I'm calling you to do today is to live more deeply into what that is. To live more deeply into what Christ has called you to be. To, yes, turn away sin in your life and chase after him, but no, do it as already an established child of God, knowing that your sinful nature has been put to death and you are free. If you're in here today and you haven't made the decision to follow Jesus, or maybe, maybe you did when you were eight. Maybe it wasn't super legitimate, or maybe your parents got you baptized when you were young, and it didn't really mean anything. If you're making that decision today, I would call you to just make that decision. Sometimes, sometimes people, God has to hound down their entire life. There's actually a poem that I identified with a lot called The Hound of Heaven. It talks about God chasing us all down. Sometimes he does that through every season of life, and, and many times he is successful and leads people to that kind of prodigal son moment where, where they come back to, to, to home. Or then sometimes it's just people on an Easter Sunday morning who maybe didn't even come to church looking for God, but God's calling them. Your father, who is love, is calling you home, and here's all you have to do. You just have to respond to him. Don't respond for the sake of your family. Don't respond for the sake of the church. Don't respond for me. Don't raise your hand. Don't do any kind of act. We don't need any action from you today. What we want you to do is to believe it in the deepest part of your soul that that's actually who Jesus is and that he, his death, his burial, his resurrection is so that he could take you from being an enemy of God to a child of God. When you believe, that's called faith. And you can do that right where you're sitting. If you make that decision today, your next step in the journey is to, to let people know. So we have baptisms coming up in three weeks, and uh, I would just love for you to be a part of a baptism uh, service here at Foundations. Not only should you sign up for this on the app and the website, uh, we have an orientation class to just kind of explain how, how it works. But after, as you do that, the other thing you should do is you should invite, you should invite everybody you know. You want everybody to know, I've stepped over the line. My identity is in who Christ is and what he's done for me, and I am a child, I'm a child of God. Today, if you're making that decision here and now, uh, we want you to stop by Next Steps on the way out and just grab a Bible. Just walk up and say, hey, I'm, I made a decision today, and we'll make sure we give you a Bible. But, but begin that journey right now. And when you grab that Bible, just start reading about Jesus. Read about love. Start reading in the Gospel uh, of Matthew. Today, I want to I want to end by praying for us, praying for followers of Christ that we would have a deeper understanding of what Christ has really done for us, that we would celebrate that, and I want to pray for everybody making a decision. Would you stand with me at both campuses, and I will pray. Father God, because of what you have done, Lord, we have something that we don't deserve, the ability to be your children. God, I pray that that wouldn't be something we just know, that wouldn't be something we just hear, but God, that in the actual practice of our life, we would live into that. We would live in that freedom. We would live in that knowing, and we would truly see ourselves as your children who are forgiven. God, I pray for anybody making a decision today, Lord, I pray you'd fill them with your Holy Spirit. I pray that you'd give them a hunger and a thirst to know you more, a hunger and a thirst to know who you are in your word, a hunger and thirst, God, to, to, to understand and know the things of this life they need, to, they need to leave behind and the things that they need to look to. 
God, I pray that you would change, change people's lives in here today. God, we thank you. We just come on Easter to thank you and to celebrate. Thank you for dying on a cross. Thank you for dying for the ungodly. Thank you for raising from the dead and overcoming the power of death with your death. God, thank you for your resurrection. We celebrate you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Happy Easter.